I'm here today to talk about surface and surface is a server side rendering, rendering component library built on top of Phoenix Live View. And before we get deeper into how the components work and how you can define components, I'd like to talk shortly about the motivation and the context uh, behind the whole thing, I mean, behind the whole project, what motivated me to start this project. So about a year ago, uh, I started working on a dashboard for Broadway uh, so I could present at the LexiConf US. And uh, I took up a few lessons from that experience, like designing the, this dashboard because it was the first uh, project that I had the opportunity to use Live View. So it was like a learning experience. And at the same time, I took a few lessons from there and a few uh, disappointments when regards to, to how we could uh, build applications, uh, especially because my background, I mean, the last uh, projects that I, I, I worked was using React, so we have all these components everywhere, and I, I kind of felt that I was something was missing when I was developing the dashboard. So the thing is, I, I needed a better way to express and use components in Phoenix, and the reasons are especially because Phoenix templates are flexible, but they're really hard to maintain, especially when you're working on a large project. I mean, the dashboard wasn't even a large project, but I felt that in many cases I, I, I was lost uh, among the templates and the lack of structure and specification of those templates. So there's no standard API to define components, right? I mean, and back then, component API was just an idea, as far as I, I know. So this was really hard for me, coming from, I mean, all the technologies I used in the past was object-oriented, and they usually have this, uh, especially when you're doing some, some, th something uh, in the front end, you, all ha you, you also can separate things in components, and I, I really miss that. So let's talk about Finite. Phoenix templates. I mean, what's wrong about Phoenix templates? Actually, there's nothing wrong about it. It's probably the best template engine out there as far as I'm, uh, I'm concerned because it's really fast, it's fantastic. But the problem is that HTML, which is the main language you use to create uh, front-end applications, HTML is a structured language, I mean, it has a hierarchy and they have, it ha defines nodes and those nodes are well has well-defined attributes and children, which are also structured. So the problem is that e for EX, everything is text. So it's really complicated that you, you, you want to produce something that is structured, but then you have a template engine that just ignores everything that is already there. I mean, every in information about parents and child nodes attributes is just ignored for EX. So I think we, we, we miss a lot that. And we also have uh, a couple of months later, we had uh, Phoenix Live Components API, which is awesome. It's definitely a great foundation to define components, and that's actually the foundation that we needed back then to create Surface. So I remember back then I was already starting working with Surface, and then I just took a couple of months break and wait until the, the component API was ready so I can build Surface uh, using that API. So it does all the heavy lifting, the state managing, event handling, diff tracking. I mean, I couldn't even imagine uh, myself doing all that stuff. I would probably would have given up the, the project if I had to do all that. So, but still, it's, it's a good foundation, but it does not define a standard way to create component specifications. 
So we need a higher level thing that say how these components should be specified and how they interact with each other. So that's basically the, what Surface tries to achieve. So we introduce a new higher level HTML-like language similar to React or Vue.js does. And we also uh, propose a standard API to define components. And we're gonna see the benefits of that. So that's, that, that's the goal. So the goal is templates should be parsed into an intermediate data structure. So we can keep the information that was in the original language, like the HTML in this case is surface templates. So we, we need to keep that information. So instead of just using EX to, uh, to process the template, we're gonna parse the template and create uh, AST, keeping all the important information we want to use later. The second thing is that we also going to need to define components will have to be specified using a standard API. So the, this API will impose uh, a few rules. And the good thing is that every component that will use this API, they're gonna share those, those specifications. So uh, this, this is important for, for what we want to achieve. And finally, we want to use both. I mean, we want to use the AST generated by the templates, right? We want to use the specifications from the components and we want to confront them, right? We want to, to, to do things that is not possible using uh, Phoenix templates. So we, we want to uh, improve development experience. So here's how, how it looks like. Here's the definition of a component. It's pretty similar to what you already have in, in Live View. This is a, uh, a component. Uh, as you can see, it defines a single property. We're gonna see that, but it has an API. So if you want to define a way to pass information to the component, you need to specify using the API. The template is a little bit different from what you used to. So the interpolation use the mustache syntax. And as you can see, you can, inject components inside the template directly, just like in React. So you don't have to interpolate to, to include a component, to inject the component in the template. So this is how it looks like. So let's start with properties. So properties are the mechanism, the basic mechanism to pass information from a parent component to a child component. So again, if you are used to work, if you're used to work with React or Vue.js, any of those technologies, this is pretty straightforward. So let's see here in action. So here's basically the, the, the example that we have in the, in the slide. So you can see it defines a property called name, and then you just print hello and whatever value is in the, in this property. So if you take a look here, not a big deal if you change here. Basically the same thing you do when you're using live component, passing the assigns. Um, it's important to notice that as I, uh, I talked about specification, here, here's what I have in mind. You can see that we define this property as required. So if for any reason you forgot to pass this information so the compiler can warn you about it. So that's a missing property. So you can do this at compile time, which is great. So this is only possible because of those two goals that we had. So we need to have the specification. We need to have a structure and then you need to confront that structure with the specification. So if, the, if we ignore that hello is a component and this is not an attribute, if you treat everything as text, we are not able to do this. So I think compile time checking is something really important for large projects. And this is one of the things that I miss the most when I'm working with templates, with Phoenix templates. So 
another cool thing is that uh, since you have that information and that information is available, so editors and other tools can also make use of that information. So you can have everything that the component, if those are the directives, you can talk about them later, but you can see that the name property is available here. So if I, if I try to, to add a property that doesn't exist, so the compiler will also warn me. So there's no property called phone, right? So you can define new property here. And and there it goes. And it was it will be via it will be available for for the editor. So to show the documentation, to see if it's required or not. So I think I, I, I missed this a lot. Maybe I was spoiled by the, the previous uh, tools I used to, to have before using React and, and so. And, but this is, this is a key point for me. I mean, the, the whole in, introspection, the, the, the ability to, to introspect the information you have, it's, it's, it's awesome. So data is quite simple. I mean, we have this already on live view and it's similar to the concept that we have in Vue.js. So it just defines the state of the component. Uh, this is not necessary if you want, I mean, if you think about live view, you can define those assign uh, anywhere. You can define an amount usually, but one thing that uh, I think it's important to define them, not only because you get all of those benefits tooling compile time validation is that you you have a place when you can look at when you look at a component you, you you can take a look at the top of the component and see what defines the component i mean you can see how it behaves what it uses, what is the state of the component instead of just a bunch of assigns that you you take a look at where this come from so i think defining data it's 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 nice even though we do we, we don't have, uh, we don't do uh, as much uh, static checking as we, we can do with properties. So here's data in action. You can define, in this case, this is like the hello world of Phoenix Live View. It's a counter. So we just have a couple of buttons and then you increment the value, decrement the value. And one interesting thing here that also comes as a benefit from the specification is that if you define the data as a default value for the data, you don't have to implement amount just to initialize that value. So any value, if you can take a look here, this is the counter, pretty basic stuff. So you can just say that you can start to at value 10. So it, it, I think it's really nice to take a look at one place and say, okay, that's the state and that's the initial state. And the same thing as uh, properties. So since this data is specified, is declared, you can, the, 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 the editor can make use of that information and list to the user. So you have more stuff here. You just be available here. And also, if you use the update or assign, we also be available here. That helps me a lot, especially if I just jump into a component that is not mine. I mean, it's someone else's component. I have no idea what's going on. So it's nice to have the, the editor helping you to be more productive. Excuse me. So we have seen properties, we have seen data, and we also have slots. So slots a little bit different from what you're used to in live view because in live view, you have inner content when you can 
kind of pass the content of the <clears throat> of the from the parent component you can pass uh, you can pass it, it's similar to properties it's a way to pass information to a component but instead of that information coming from attributes which is which are properties on, on in, in components you, you you pass this information as the body of the component so Here's how it looks like. We have a button here, which defines a single slot, which is the default slot. And the slot is, is like a placeholder. So whenever you have a slot inside a component, this is gonna become a public interface. So you can pass that information, you can pass that content to the component so it can be replaced. So in this case, you define a, a, a default slot and the default slot is placed here. So if you use the button and we just say, change my style as the content. So you're gonna have a button with the label, change my style. So again, it's not very sophisticated, but that's the way, uh, you can use default slot. Usually, usually using default slot to just pass a string is not the something usual uh, because you can pass a string just as a property. But since the HTML button receives the label as in, in the body, so it's interesting to keep that same uh, that the same API for, for that. But the thing is that you can actually create more than one slot. You can create multiple slots. For instance, if you have a card component, you can create like the default slot, which would be like the main content. You can have the footer, you can have a header, header. You, you can have multiple slots and then you have to name them. So a slot without any name, it's just the default slot. So other slots, you put the name, say the footer, and we work exactly the same way. So when you're using the component, using the card component, whatever you pass here is gonna be placed in the default slot. And whatever you pass here using template slot footer, it's gonna be placed inside all that. And if the slot is not required, you can also place uh, fallback content. For, for that slot. So this is pretty similar to, for what you have in other, tech, other technologies. This is basically a template and slot are specified in the HTML specification. We don't have a strong, uh, we are not forced to follow that. So we have a few things that are different, but it, it, since the other technologies already use it, and people are already familiar with it, we decided to use that approach uh, on slots. So, another thing, again, about the specification is that if, since this uh, slot is required, if for some reason, like here, like we have the default slot, All the buttons are. <laughs> so since you have the default slot and the default slot is defined as required, in case you don't pass it, we're gonna have a warning. So we always, the compiler tries to, to inform you of anything that it's not quite right. And he knows that because of the specification. Slots can also be very interesting in a way that you, sometimes you want to define a component, but uh, you don't, it, 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 there's a common logic in the component, even a common, uh, comp a, component uh, a common behavior, but there are some pieces of the component that should be injected. So you can use slots to do that and you can pass information to the parent, so you can use that. 
as well to customize that that content so this is for instance uh, a component called rating it's pretty basic it's, it's similar to the other one but the difference here is that uh, we have value that you can increment and decrement but i don't want to when i design the component i don't want i don't know how to render the, 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 the that information so the component will be responsible to hold the value of the counter it's going to hold the, the buttons that we're going to uh, increment and decrement the value and we're going to ha handle all the events but we're just going to let the user say how he's going to render that information so if you take a look at this example you're going to see that i'm using this component twice here in this view so the first one we are using we are passing the content of this the default slot right and you just print we just rent in the value directly so that's what you can see here the second one a little bit more sophisticated you just have some logic to render stars instead of the value so you can see it receives the values so otherwise i'm not i i don't know what's the status of the counter i mean all the implementation, all the details are inside the component. But doing this, you can actually pass the information back to the parent so the parent can customize the rendering. So here you can have the same component uh, rendering things differently, customized. So they are really powerful. I really like uh, to, to develop components based on slots. There are also other, other things that you can do with slots. I mean, you, you can create renderless components that will act like just as data. Sometimes you have, for, for instance, if you're trying to print a table like a grid, and one way people do this is like the, they pass the data information and then they pass the columns as parameters. So you have like this, you create a data structure to, to, and, 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 and fill your, your properties with that data structure. So instead you can use the, the the template itself to, to use the nodes to use to create custom components to do that that will act as data so you can have the grid you can create the component and you can create another component called column that will just hold the information you want to pass so it's a more declarative way to do this which matches perfect what we have in html so this you can this is you have the documentation you everything it's you you want to do if you want to use this it's using the same principle you can also use generators so it's you, you want to extend that example and now the columns you actually want to pass snippets of code for each column so you can actually use the <clears throat> the property and define a generator so defining a variable and that variable will be available might be available in the column so here you have like you have the a list of uh, uh items in the parent you pass that to the parent the parent handle all that stuff it interacts with the the list and then calls each column using slots so it's really powerful you can create really beautiful code using that approach and the, what, the last thing i want to talk about the api is context and it's it's uh it's something that you have to be careful if you want to use it because context allow you, allows you to pass information to children without pa using properties so you can define a con something in the context and then down deep in the tree any child can ask for that information so this is something that i say well don't don't abuse uh of this i mean use uh, i usually use for only localized things like forms so i think it's one thing but don't use context like in the top of your page and define a bunch of stuff i mean you're gonna lose a lot of things uh you, you're gonna lose uh information because it's gonna be everything implicit and i don't think it's a good thing but i think it matches perfect with forms as you can see here, if uh, you already work with forms in using Phoenix templates, 
you need to def define the form and then pass the variable to each field and each input. And sometimes it's it just too much information. I mean, it, you don't need to pollute the code that much. If you, so you can use context in, 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 in form. So your, your component can define that that form instance in the beginning and any child can access that form internally. So in that case, I think it's pretty obvious that this is happening. Unlike if you just put the context at the beginning of the page. So contexts are useful. I think it's great to create a uh, very clean code, but it comes with a price. Don't abuse. So I would say that the first rules of using context is to not use context at all, unless, for something very similar. Uh, there is another kind of component that we cannot find as well in Phoenix, which is the macro components. Uh, and they are really handy. I mean, this one's the Markdown component. You can actually create a component that you say, look, uh, Surface, don't parse the content. I will parse the content myself. So you can actually, you, you create a way to extend the language. So the website of uh, the Surface website use this a lot because it's really handy. So if you can take a look here, this is the code from the website. So you can just mix HTML, you have the components here, and then you have Markdown, you can just start using it, you have syntax highlighting, so it's, I think it's really, really handy. It, I mean, the whole website was, was basically using the markup, uh, the markdown component, including all the, the, the other fancy stuff that, that you can see, you can mix, uh, you can mix uh, markdown with HTML and whatever, so. It's really powerful. This is also a macro component. So this is really cool because I can have this content here, this source code, and I say surface don't uh, evaluate this code right now because I want to show it highlighted. And then I say, now you can do it. So I don't have to duplicate this code here to actually render this and then add this code again to, for syntax highlighting. It's just one code. And he, he can render this and we can use it directly here. So again, macro components also follow the same rules of macros in Elixir. So don't use it unless you really need it. And documentation and examples you can find on this temporary uh, web page, uh, as soon as you have the first table release, we <clears throat> gonna move this to a proper um, domain. But I want you to show you this, which is the documentation that we have, it, which is all generated uh, from the component specification. So. If you generate a component, if you create a component, you can use those same components here to expose the API. So it's really nice that you can just take a look at the component and see everything that the components has as a public API. You can see all these properties, you can see the type, you can see which values it accepts. If there's a default value, you can see if it defines any slot. So, and what is the meaning of that slot? If you had some events, so everything is introspected. So it's really nice to, I, 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 I felt that when I was in the dashboard, I was looking for components and I said, well, how does this component work? I, I don't know, because everyone will document that component differently. Some people will not even document it at all. So you just have to go into the, into the code to find out how it works. So it's really nice. Go take a look at the website and if you have questions, if you want to help, just open an issue. So to wrap up, uh, the benefits of such a pro is compile time validation as you've seen it. 
the structure is validated against the specification. This is crucial, this is important, and this improves a lot uh, the experience. So we can have custom code generation like directives, similar to Vue.js, events. We can customize the way events work in Surface. It's, it's uh, for instance, if you work, if, if you define a component and you want the component to handle the, the events, you need to use the Phoenix target and set it to myself. In Surface, we don't need to do that. By default, when you define uh, the, the event, you're gonna, if, you def, if you pass an event to an element, you can handle that event locally without doing this because you know who's the parent, you know who's the children. And introspection, tooling, editors, as you can see, I just started to do this plugin for Elixir Science, so it will be soon available for uh, Elixir Language Server and any other editors that use Elixir Science. So the current, current status of the project is that I just released the first uh, release candidate, and it, it should be a stable release. The, it will uh, turn into a stable release as soon as Live View, uh, the next version of Live View is out because it depends on something that was recently uh, added to Live View. So, at least from the API perspective, there's no plan to change it until the first stable view, uh, release. So, feel free to use it, create components, and What's next? So basically, since now we have the foundation ready and we have the API uh, stable, uh, we are just start to create components. So I started to create a few components using Bulma, uh, Lloyd, which is uh, another core member, uh, is using Tailwind. So there are people trying different things and it would be great if you have something, if you want to share, it would be great. Uh, scoped CSS style is something that we're working on. So if you know what it is, uh, it, some people love it, some people hate it. So I'm in the middle right now. I'm not sure if you're going to implement this directly into Surface, but it seems we can come up with some, some middle ground to have maybe parts of it and that can be extended by other libraries. Maybe a couple of mix tests, uh, more tooling, and what else? I mean, you're the ones that are gonna say what else. I mean, we, now that you have a release candidate, people can actually start uh, using it. Let's see how it goes. So that's what I have for you today. There's a, a lot more uh, in, on Surface. Take a look at the website if you want. There's a lot of documentation. It took me a long time to get all the documentation, but I think it's, it's, it's worth it. If, you, if you're interested, take a look there. If you have questions, open issues. And I just want to very shortly thank uh, two people, which is uh, Jose, that was very patient. Uh, I, find myself, I find myself a few times on, on a dead end, and he was there to rescue me. So I'm really grateful for that. And to Lloyd Remy, which is... Um, did a great job in the compiler. So without these two people, uh, Surface wouldn't be ready. <laughs> so thank you very much. Oh, that's, that's really nice. You can see the, uh, the round of applause there. Thanks everybody. Uh, and thank you, Marlis. Um, I really enjoyed the demo, especially. Um, yeah, so let's, let's move on to questions. Uh, we have, uh, we have some time for questions, fortunately, um, and you can upvote them so that the order changes uh, while we're asking. Um, maybe you could do that as soon as possible. Um, and so let's just, uh, let's see who's, who's at the top. Um, that would be Damien. Um, I think you should be able to unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask that question. So uh, is it possible to use files for templates instead of the HCGO? Yep, sure. Uh, you can create a S face files and just call up, uh, just put in the same folder and we'll pick up this file if, if you just put the same name. Just okay. like Phoenix. Yeah, just like Phoenix Live View. Great. 
Uh, and then the other one toward the top is, uh, uh, let's see, who is that? Um, Heiko, uh, maybe you're able to unmute. Yeah, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah um, at first, I'm really, uh, yeah, really, really happy to hear your talks. Great stuff, really great stuff. Thank you. Um, Thank you. My question is I don't know how to handle state um, universal, so universal state. Uh, I'm, I'm used a little bit to Vue and, and SwiftUI, and then you have something like Redux or so. Do you have some kind of pattern there too? Uh, I mean, I, I had many discussions about something similar with Redux, uh, especially with Jose. And the thing is, uh, Redux is the way it is because they don't have OTP, right? So we have OTP. And state managing in Erlang in general is so much easier to do than in, in JavaScript. And Phoenix already comes with PubSub, which, I mean, if you use PubSub, you basically, along with components, it's probably everything you need. There are some, some things that I want to explore later. It, it's uh, basic to make a little bit more, uh, a little bit less uh, bureaucracy, so especially when you're using PubSub, but those are just experiments and uh, let's see how it goes. But basically, it, in general, you don't need Redux, but in everything is on the server, the state is on the live view is on the server. You have OTP, you have PubSub, you have events, so it's, it's, it's quite different. 